I've said that the church is at a crossroads of confusion. Because we live in a time when more than any other time in the modern era, there is in world culture a dramatic sense of estrangement from the church and what the church represents in the world. And in this country, particularly, more and more people find themselves estranged from the church, if not alienated from it, and find themselves fairly uninterested in joining us in our solemn assemblies. And that is because there is a profound confusion about the church's message. What really is the church's message that people are hearing? Well, one message is that you are all worthless sinners, that you are deeply steeped in an original sin from which you cannot escape, that you are deserving of a, an eternal life burning in hell, and that your only hope of being saved from that is that there is Jesus of Nazareth and if you believe that he was a sacrifice for your sake because he was God incarnate, then your belief will get you into this place called heaven instead of going to this place called hell. So the message of the church is you must believe that Jesus is the one and the only one that can make it possible for you to go into heaven, so you must believe that he has done for you what you could not do for yourself. And that he was, in fact, the incarnation of God because God alone could make up for the sinfulness of man. So he took the form of man so that a man underline the word man, incidentally, a man could be the sacrifice that pays your debt to God. Now, that's one message. And then, underneath that message is that certain churches will claim, and we are the church that has that truth, and if you're a member of our church, of our denomination, of our orientation, then you're in the right place at the right time with the right message and your belief will save you and your belief is that someone else has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's one message. The other message is Jesus is a paradigm for what all of us are called to be and rather than doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, Jesus is the one who shows us all that we can do for ourselves. That we can take responsibility for our own lives and that we can be the ones who make it possible that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That we are the ones who have this ministry of reconciliation, God making his appeal through us. That this is what Jesus has shown us. And so rather than being someone who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, Jesus calls us to be all that he has been and suggests that we can even do greater things than he has done. That's another message. Another message of the church is that 
It's all about God and God's will for us. And that Jesus is the messenger of God who calls us into righteousness the same way that Amos called his worshiping community into righteousness. And that God calls us to do justice and to follow righteousness. And that it's really about our obedience to the will of God. And Jesus is the example of what obedience to the will of God is all about. And so Jesus is the one who portrays what having what is called a God consciousness is all about. And that we are really called to live out our lives with that sense of God consciousness, which is to do justice, to follow righteousness, and to be those that Jesus talked about in the Beatitudes. Now these are all clear messages that people have heard from the church. You can understand why people say, I don't know what the church represents. I don't know what the message of the church is. There are too many messages coming to me. What is the Christian message? Then there's confusion about the church's mission. What is the church's mission? To call us out of the world because the world is evil? And so we have to be other than the world because the world is grounded in all the sinfulness that constitutes our humanity. And so we need to emotionally withdraw from the world and center ourselves only on the divine? Or is the church's mission to enter into the world fully and self-consciously and committedly to try to bring a sense of good news to a world in despair, to try to bring a sense of healing to a world that is broken? To, to be more involved in the world in order to transform the world? Or is the church, church's mission to give us a kind of psychological island in this desert of discomfort in the world so that we can come to a service of worship on a Sunday morning and sort of renew our spirits like an electric automobile plugging in. So we can then go back into the world where everything is bad. And it's all about my personal salvation. I renew myself. And it's up to everyone else to renew himself or herself. And so I simply focus on my personal relationship with God and my personal Savior, that is Jesus. And that's where it's at. So is the mission the charging station? That's the church's mission, to be my charging station? And remind me that I am among the saved so that when I go back into the world, I can remember that I have been taken care of because of what I believe. Or am I called into the world to pursue justice and to let righteousness flow down like a flowing stream? And then there's confusion about who this person Jesus is. Is Jesus human and shows me where I can be? Is Jesus divine and shows me everything I cannot be? Is Jesus God disguised in human form? Is Jesus the only begotten Son of God? So he's human, but not like any of the rest of us. Who is this Jesus? Is he a teacher? They called him rabbi. 
who brings a new insight into what human life is all about? Or is he God disguised as human doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves? So what's the church really saying about who Jesus is? And do we confuse this all the time? We talk about my relationship to Jesus and my relationship to God as if they're the same thing. Jesus is in this place, God is in this place. How do you distinguish that? And then fundamentally, while we come here to worship God, the church seems confused about the reality of God. We talk about God. We talk about the will of God. We talk about what God wishes for us. We talk about what God does for us. Does the church know what it's talking about when it talks about God? Is God a being up there? Is God simply a spirit in our midst? Is God the ground of being, the first cause? Is God being itself or a being greater than all other beings? So when the church talks about God, you can see why people are confused about what are you talking about? So we seem to have some mixed messages about the reality of God. We seem to have some mixed messages about the reality of Jesus. We have some mixed messages about the mission of the church. We have some mixed messages about the nature of the church. And some people are saying, I don't need this. I can do justice without the church. I can do righteousness without the church. I can work for justice without the church. I can love without the church. So what is the church called to be today? Well, my reading is that the church is that institution that forms, at least in its idealized state, a community committed to becoming the beloved community. When I was um, a civil rights worker in Texas, in 1968. Other civil rights workers who were just as dedicated to social justice as I would ask me, why, why do you have to tie this to the church? I'm committed to racial justice. I'm committed to the equality of persons. I'm committed to the acceptance of all people. Why, why does it have to be related to the church? And my answer was, and this is just my answer, the things that we face in our world, the racism, the bigotry, the neo-Nazism, the anti-Semitism, the homophobia, the lust for blood, the nationalism, the use of people, the degrading of our environment, all of those things are systemic. They are so profoundly systemic and they are all inst institutionalized by institutions that benefit from all of that. And the only institution that can stand up to those institutions are communities of faith because 
in my reading of it back in 1968, the only institutions that I saw that even used the language of love and caring were the religious communities. And I was firmly convinced, and still am, that when you have institutionalized bigotry, when you have institutionalized hatred, when you have institutionalized prejudice, that the only thing strong enough to stand up to that institutionalization of evil is the strong institutionalization of love. And that's why I went into ministry. And that's why I have stayed so committed to the church. Because if ever there was a need for a voice that spoke the language of love, it is now. I mean, just listen to the news. And we need to cut through the confusion of who we are and what we're about and get down to what Jesus himself was saying. That what, ha what we are called to do is to love the neighbor as ourselves. That what we're called to do, as the prophets would say, is to walk humbly with God, not assuming we know all about God. We walk humbly with God whatever the reality of God is, quit confusing our concepts of God with the reality of God. Quit arguing about our concepts of God with one another and go to the experience of God. And where is it that we experience what we can call the transcendent most meaningfully, that which allows us to go beyond ourselves? To me, it is always in the context of love. It's only in loving and being loved that I understand that in which I live and move my have my being most fully. It's only in the context of loving and being loved that I experience my own personal self-realization. I am also I'm always lesser than I can be when I am not loving. I am also always lesser than I can be when I'm not loved. And it is the community of faith, not belief. It is the community of faith that has the faith that God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. That's the message. It's not confusing. It's not prideful. It says, our belief is that whatever ultimate reality is, whatever the source of being is, our highest experience of it is loving and being loved. And that's what we're called to do. As Paul would say, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You are called to love the other. And when that message goes out, that message is clear and unambiguous and stands clearly over against prejudice, bigotry, demeaning of others. It always affirms life and celebrates what life can be. And then a personality such as Jesus begins to make sense to the modern mind because this is the one who lived the life of love and showed us that we can live the life of love and showed us that we now can have this ministry of reconciliation. And then our mission becomes clear. So rather than deal with Okay, we've got the right answer and you've got the wrong one. We've got the right religion and you've got the wrong one. We're saying there is only one great human experience that is fulfilling and self-actualizing, and that is the human experience of loving and being loved. 
And that's what our message is. That's what we have seen in Christ. You in another religion may have seen it in one of your leaders. You in another orientation may have seen it in one of your people. But for us that call ourselves Christians, we have seen it in the personality of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who points beyond himself to what we can be and that allows us to open up to the possibility of knowing what we call God, but who we can never know fully. So our message is clear. Our mission is clear. But the world out there needs to hear it. Because they're hearing all these other confusing things. They're hearing all this stuff about their sinfulness and their inadequacy. And they're lucky that they're being saved from hell. And they need to start hearing about their possibilities and self-actualization and their capacity for loving and being agents of, of reconciliation and justice and righteousness in the world. And when we can have that, then the church leaves the crossroads of confusion and enters into the world of relevance, staying faithful to the message and more relevant than ever to the world. That's what we need to remember. That's what we need to be sharing with our neighbors. That's what we need to be talking to other people about. That's the voice we need to bring to contemporary social issues. And it applies. Love of our planet, love of our neighbor, love of each person who's precious and unique, love of ourselves, love of our community. So then maybe Amos's dark days become days of light because through the ministry of reconciliation and love, we began to experience life fully and meaningfully the way we've seen in the Christ and the way we come to understand the reality of God. May it be so.